Hello and welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Aaron Forrest and coming up in today's newscast, the Likud party primaries are over and the results may be a bit surprising. Meanwhile, look at the propaganda machine that is the media coverage in Gaza. And later, yet another controversy now erupting around the upcoming World Cup tournament in Qatar. Campaigns are over and the votes are locked in. The Likud party under Chairman Benjamin Netanyahu finishing up the count for its primaries ahead of national elections in November. There's electricity in the air, as Likud Knesset member Amir Ohana puts it in this final campaign video. This as the Likud party, led by former Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu, nearly finished with counting the 80,000 votes from its primaries. Likud is expecting to get some 35 seats in the next Knesset after November elections, and it looks like Netanyahu's loyalists, like M.K. Zohana and Yariv Levin, are taking many of the top spots. Additionally, a number of first-time Knesset members making the top 30, as well as returning politician and former U.N. ambassador Dani Danon, who was left out of the previous government altogether. Then, aside from the slots set aside for the regionally elected Likud heads, Netanyahu directly appointing a number of seats, likely including Edith Silman and Amichai Shikli, who left former Prime Minister Naftali Bennett's Yamina faction. Netanyahu assuring voters that his appointments would help secure a national victory. <laughs> פתק שתמצאו אותו מאחורי הפרגוד, בעד או נגד ההצעה שלי לשריין עד חמישה אנשים למקומות עד 43 ברשימת הליכוד. זה חשוב, זה יכול לתת לנו את הניצחון. Former Knesset speaker and Likud No. 2, Yuli Edelstein, on the other hand, is not doing so well, despite displaying confidence ahead of the count, even suggesting that his type of politics would actually reward Likud in November. ואם בקדמת הרשימה, בצמרת הרשימה, יהיו אנשים עם כל הצניעות כמוני שיכולים לדבר עם מצביעי מרכז, מה שנקרא ימין ממלכתי, עם מצביעי הציונות הדתית, עם העולים, אז אני חושב שיש תקווה אמיתית להביא עוד מנדטים. Edelstein is seemingly being punished for having challenged Netanyahu's leadership in a previous vote, and he's now in 23rd place and falling on the list, with some suspecting that this means he may not make it into Knesset at all. In a rare moment of honesty during Operation Breaking Dawn last weekend, the international community getting a split-second glimpse of the truth surrounding news coverage in Gaza. This as the Hamas terror group publishes its now rescinded rules for what the media can cover and how. Joining me to discuss is founder and director of Palestinian Media Watch, Itamar Marques. Itamar, it is great to have you back with us. So journalists were given Palestinian sponsors and all of them were pressured to, quote, demonstrate national spirit, defend the Palestinian narrative by ignoring Palestinian rocket misfires and military capabilities, and blame Israel for escalations. Is this at all new for Hamas? It's not new for Hamas, and it has been Palestinian Authority policy for the longest time as well. And in this, in this particular case, it was so important for Hamas because one of the most important messages, uh, I would word it differently, one of the most important demonizations that the Palestinian Authority does to the world about Israel is to say that we kill Palestinian children. And there were a number of Palestinian children who were killed in Gaza by those misfires. And for the Palestinian Authority, it was critical. It was critical to not to let the world know that they were responsible for those deaths because they are planning on using those deaths in the international community. Uh, they, were, they brought them up in the UN and they're gonna be bringing them up for years about all the children who were killed. So, uh, it's the, the narrative is more important than the reality for the Palestinian Authority and, they, and Hamas, and they have no inhibitions about putting all different kinds of pressure on, on journalists to make their story uh, get out there. 
All right, but you know, if but Hamas rescinded the order uh, at, at some point, so uh, does that mean that we can trust the the media reporting in Gaza, or are the reports uh, undergoing ongoing suppression? You know, I, I, I'm thinking, for example, of an Arab media journalist who was caught lying about an Islamic Jihad misfire while the cameraman was filming it live on air. Yes. We're not going to be able to trust because uh, Hamas is very threatening, and of course, so, uh, all the foreign journalists all have Palestinians who work for them. Uh, all of these people can be threatened, so that even if the actual orders might have been rescinded, uh, the fear is always in the background, um, and you're going to get the Palestinian story, uh, even on things that are purely factual. And we've been having this for years. For example, um, a Palestinian will attack an Israeli at, at a roadblock or an attack an Israeli at some place and then be shot and killed. The, the, foreign, the, the Israeli press, of course, will report what happened. The Palestinian press will report that Israel did an extrajudicial killing or, or a cold-blooded murder of a Palestinian. And that the international community will usually give Israel's story first, and then they will say, the Palestinians insist that the person wasn't a terrorist, but the person was murdered by Israel. So the, the foreign journalists, even though they know it's not true, they always have to include the Palestinian twisting of, of, uh, of the events, because otherwise they're going to find themselves well, in so, a lot of trouble. Well, so again, though, how do you make sense of injury and death counts and things like that that come out of, you know, the Strip or the West Bank, for that matter, when everything is still approved or rejected by groups like Hamas? Hamas is notorious for conflating militants with civilians and underreporting deaths. But at the same time, you don't only want to take Israel's word for it, do you? I think all foreign journalists know that Israel is very, very cautious when it releases uh, information about, uh, certainly about deaths of Palestinians. Uh, there have been cases where Israel has been criticized by other Israelis for, for waiting too long to make an announcement. So, for example, the Palestinians will talk about Israel killing a civilian, uh, and Israel will check the story, and three days later, Israel will say, we checked it, and it was actually a Palestinian, or it was, uh, or it was something else. By then, the whole world has already accepted the Palestinian narrative. So, the international community, if they want to be objective, they know that the Israeli army, uh, the Israeli government is issuing information that is correct. So why do you think that is? Because again, this, this uh, issue is apparent in Western media as well, in Western media coverage from, from Gaza and the West Bank as well. Look, we, we know that um, the international media very often uh, in, in, in so many conflicts, there has to be a David and there has to be a Goliath. Uh, take a look at the Ukraine. The Ukrainians are clearly David fighting the Goliath, which is Russia. Uh, for many years, they've been very, very happy to paint the Palestinians as a David fighting against Israel, the Goliath, even though uh, that wasn't at all an accurate uh, description of what was going right. on. Uh, they ignored Israeli terror. They looked at Israel uh, terror, sorry, Palestinian terror against Israelis. They would present that as poor David having to fight with with his stone against uh, uh, against the terrible Israelis. So that's the narrative that they've chosen for. So when there's a story that contradicts with the narrative that the international community has, is David and Goliath narrative, well, they, they're going to be very, very happy to present the Palestinian message, even when they know in their hearts that it's really a false message. Well, so, and, and again, where's the pressure on coverage maybe... Uh, uh, how, how does the pressure on coverage in Gaza compare to that of the PA? I know you said that they're both problematic, but is it better in the West Bank or just as risky? The, the murder of Nizar Banat comes to mind. Yes. Uh, the, um, uh, in the West Bank, there have been so many. There have been dozens and dozens of arrests uh, of Palestinians who criticize the Palestinian Authority. Um, we haven't heard of arrests of foreign journalists, foreigners who are in the country who have been criticizing the Palestinian Authority, if they criticize. Uh, I would say even more of the criticism is coming from Palestinians themselves who are, who are fed up with the Palestinian Authority. In fact, it's quite ironic that the international community is giving a lot of, uh, a lot more rope to the PA to, in spite of the fact that their own people have given up on them with 80% thinking they're corrupt and 80% wanting elections and wanting our boss to resign. Itamar Marcus, thank you so, so much for joining us again. Thank you. Just a little over three months left until the 2022 FIFA World Cup in Qatar. But Israeli fans are not really among the most excited as the games hit yet another bump in the road. LTV's Kayla Eberlin reporting. The 2022 FIFA World Cup beginning November 20th in Qatar, the first Arab state to ever host the games. 
And, thanks to months of talks with FIFA, then Foreign Minister Yair Lapid announced in June that Israeli fans will be allowed to travel to the competition in Doha. But, on the official site to buy travel packages, run by an apparently Qatari company, Israelis got a reminder of where some Qatari attitudes still lie. Israel is not listed as a FIFA member state, and fans are instead directed to choose the occupied Palestinian territories. One Israeli fan telling the media, this is a disgrace, and if Qatar was chosen to host the games, it must include all member states, and allow fans from all over the world. Of course, this is hardly the only controversy surrounding the 22 World Cup tournament. In fact, several senior FIFA members are on record saying it was a blatant mistake to let Qatar host. Qatar was awarded hosting duties in 2010, but there are widespread allegations of bribery and corruption surrounding the decision, over which two members of FIFA's executive committee were suspended and several arrests were later made in ensuing investigations. Additionally, Qatar's summer heat forced the games from spring-summer to November, causing massive upset among the European League's normal schedules. Initially, Qatar even scheduled the opening ceremonies to precede their own first game against Ecuador, as opposed to the actual first match of the tournament. And all this to say nothing of the numerous other problems, including human rights issues that are raising concerns, the risk of imprisonment, or worse, for LGBT fans, for example, and allegations of systematic abuse of migrant workers and even slave laborers who are building the needed infrastructure. In other news, with food security an ever-present concern, food waste is an increasingly growing problem, particularly in the West. But a new and unique Israeli innovation may soon be the solution. Joining me to talk about it is CEO of Microbiome, Erez Danieli. Erez, it's great to have you with us. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Thank you very much. All right, so let, let's start with the, defining the problem. There are hundreds of millions of tons of fresh produce that are produced every year. 40% of it goes to landfill? Yes. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, around 40% of that going to waste. We're speaking about hundreds of thousands of millions of tons, metric tons that are going to waste annually. How does that translate into dollars and cents? Well, it's around half a trillion dollars per half annum. A, half, half a trillion. trillion. 400 billion to 500 billion a year. Take into consideration that these numbers are only going to grow. The problem only going to be a, a grow because in one hand you have population that keep on growing and you're probably going to speak about 10 billion people globally in, tw in two decades from now and global warming is not going to be a Gonna, gonna disappear. So you have a short, shortage of land and water at the other end. And this is a problem that continues with us for a long period of time. So what are some of the, what are some of the biggest drivers for this waste? Uh, it's across the supply chain. So you have a, when you are a post harvesting, you are taking the agricultural produce across the supply chain for processing plants and uh, Pack, pack houses and then marine container to ship them all over the world. And uh, across this uh, supply chain, you have waste exactly like in your refrigerator. Okay. So in your refrigerator, probably you know every once in a while you can have your uh, rotten, uh, rotten yeah. apple or rotten pear. So multiply it by thousands of thousands and you have the same across the supply chain worldwide. All right, so how, how does microbiome intend to fix that? Like, what, what's the solution? Well, I, what's the tech? I will try to simplify it. Sure, please. Okay? <laughs> for, for me, yeah. especially. For me. It's, Not for yeah. me. For me and for you. So now we are surrounding in this uh, nice studio with thousands of different spe species of bacteria. Mm. And those bacteria are actually the numbers that uh, uh, scientists are familiar, familiar sure. with are around 2 million. And you have those existing bacteria everywhere, and you have it within, within those processing warehouses as well. Most of them are beneficial bacteria, but, but some of them are harmful bacteria, and those are the ones who are creating all the problem and the microbial, microbial spoilage. What we are doing, we're actually changing the balance. We are usually using a green and very natural solution to change the balance within those storage places and cooling rooms we have a mixture of strains of beneficial bacteria that uh, with nutrients that we are using 
we can stable it for a long period of time. time. And when we are applying it in, in a storage room, we actually taking control of the entire uh, cavity. So instead of having, let's say, 80% of pathogens within the room and 20% of good bacteria, right. we, are, uh, we, are, we are changing it to 80 or 90% of our good bacteria. Okay, so you have this so-called good bacteria yes. that is Takes essentially... Control. Th that is essentially taking the sp taking up all the nutrients and the and the resources Correct. of the negative bacteria. Correct. A and then at the end of the day, it's it's a completely natural process that or, or, it's or a completely natural completely natural. natural actually, uh, uh, what technology. we are correct. What you're actually saying, we are empowering nature. We are. And it's empowering... healthy for consumers to eat it. Yes. Yes. Because and it keeps using... the food on the shelf longer. <laughs> correct. It, it's uh, keep the food on the shelf life. It is re reducing uh, almost completely the waste and the microbial spoilage. And it's actually very holistic approach because what we are doing, we are not uh, tackling only one kind of bacteria. Right. We are changing the entire, uh, I would say, uh, the entire microbiome right. of the, cav the, the cavity of the treated area. So we're actually good for colis, E. coli, and salmonella, and botrytis, and gray root, and any other bacteria that you don't know them and I Would don't Would you consider know them. it probiotic or is that, or no, that doesn't really apply here? It's, 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 a pro, it's probiotic, but <laughs> some, by the way, some of those bacteria are not exactly the same are the ones that you are using in your Actimel, for example. You know, the right. Danone Actimel. Well, so, so where else can this be applied, though? Is this like, can this technology or, or this process be used in, say, the medical field? Yes, it can. So if you think about this holistic approach, we are taking control of the entire space and we are, you know, reducing the amount of pathogens. You can take it into hospitals, for example, and replacing the disinfection uh, 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 cleaning wow. that they are using today. And this is one of the proof of concept that we're actually doing today with one of the uh, leading hospitals in Israel. Or you is, can- Is that what's next right now for microbiome then? I hope so. I hope so. All, 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 all also chicken crops and cow sheds, you know, they have a lot of E. coli and salmon, salmonella issues as well. And if we can reduce it by using natural solution, it could be fantastic. I, I mean, it's, a, it's an incredible solution. It's a very unique solution. It is. Um, it is. And, and I understand that it is one of the trending accredited investments on uh, Investination. So if, uh, if people, it's a crowdfunding platform, so people at home who want to get in on this, uh, that is where you want to find it on Investination, search microbiome. Erez, thank you so much for telling us about this. This is amazing. Thank you very much for your time. Now, shopping in Israel is about to get a whole lot easier and, more importantly, cheaper. This as e-commerce giant AliExpress announces its latest plans for expansion. Chinese retail monolith AliExpress is officially setting up delivery warehouses in Israel. The decision announced on Wednesday and the depots set to officially open at the end of August. Additionally, to celebrate, a huge number of Hebrew-listed goods on the website are currently heavily marked off. Israel has long considered itself an island in the Middle East, as Israeli consumers have largely had to import their goods. And with online shopping, this has only become more true. In fact, despite its tiny size, Israel is the world's 36th largest market for e-commerce, with a revenue of over $6 billion U.S. in 2021 and an average of over two online purchases per second. But Israelis still suffer notoriously long waits for their products, which can often take over a month to arrive. And that's what makes this such huge news. With local AliExpress distribution centers in Israel, the popular retailer can reduce the cost to consumers and shorten delivery times to just three to seven days. Now this next question goes to all of the Israeli and Jewish American parents out there. Are you satisfied with your kids' Jewish education? Because it would seem that you're not, judging by how many Jewish American children are left out of private schools. So if you're a parent who wants to take advantage of the education in your area, but you don't because of distance or cost or another issue, don't fret as there is help. With the details is Tamar Ilana Rothenberg. Thank you so much for joining us, Tamar. Now, you transferred your kids from public to private school. What drove you to do this? Yes, well, mainly it's because um, I want them to, to have the, the Jewish values at home, and it's important for them, the environment that they're in, uh, who they, they, re they relate to. And I didn't see that. Um, the, I, I saw that the, the level of academic 
in the non-Jewish school, in the public schools, it's, it was a little bit higher than private Jewish schools, right. but is the priorities need to change that. And also depending when, when the kids are like getting older, they're having a, the bar, bar of bad needs. Huh? Sure. And it's important for them that the environment is a neutral environment with Jewish values. And I saw a lot of change, especially with my oldest son coming from public school to, to private school, Jewish school, uh, because dramatically he changed uh, everything. He was playing more video games at home. He was, uh, his, his interest changed in right. everything. Uh, in, in his friends are the same. He, he maintained the friends that he had in the public schools and now he has new friends in the private school, but his main interests, his main motiv motivations, his, uh, you know, e e every morning that he wakes up, it's, it's, it's a new thing and that's because of the school. Well, so, the environment is very important for them. Well, so, so Tamal, you know, what were some of the biggest challenges in actually making the switch, you know, in, in terms of cost, in terms of distance perhaps, and how did you overcome those issues? Yes. Um, Mainly, and the, the 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 main point with the with the private Jewish schools are the the cost, the, the high tuition cost, right. and in this particular school, they help us with with scholarships, not only state scholarships in Florida, also they help you with uh, local uh, scholarships that that are funded by by local donors from the school, mm. and also uh, from a lot of places in Florida. Uh, that they provide help. So the, the administration in the Jewish Academy, they focused on, on providing you the help, the necessary help to, to, to help you to not pay a penny if you go to Jewish private schools. And, and, and again, maybe going back to your kids, how did they feel about this move? Because I know that you wanted to instill this appreciation for Jewish values and heritage, but you know, are they happy with, with this? Uh, you know, what are some of the, maybe the differences socially, educationally, that, that they underwent? But I, I, uh, at the beginning, I was a little, they were a little bit like nervous uh, doing this change, of course. But now they, they, they say that they don't, they, they don't want to go back. They want to stay. Really? They want to receive Jewish education. And even if they're still little and they're still growing, but they see the, the values that, of course, we have it at home. We have a very neutral home that care about Israel, and we're very Zionist. But they see that portrayed, and they say, "I don't know how we were not in private schools before, and and this is what we want. This is this is what we what we're looking forward to. We want a private Jewish education because our values are there." They they didn't fight you at all initially, or they they were just a little nervous. They were nervous because they didn't, at the beginning, they didn't know what to expect, especially the oldest, the oldest was the, the, the first one. So he was right. nervous for a new environment. Of course, every kid with changes, they hesitate a little bit. But then they saw the impact that they have in, in their own lives. Like, uh, and I cannot tell you how much he changed, his motivations changed. Uh, the rabbis in the school not only uh, are like, like looking up to him every single time, it's a very more nurture environment, not only the mm. Jewish values, the people are more centered into the to, today's value. And, and with, with the chaotic things that are going outside, they, fe they feel loved. Well, yeah. if you at home, anybody want to take part and check eligibility for free Jewish scholarship in the United States uh, for your kids, scan the code on the screen that is uh, playing now or click on the link before if you're watching this on social media. Tamar, thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Now let's take a look at the weather forecast. The forecast is calling for clear skies tonight with lows averaging around 21 degrees Celsius or 69 Fahrenheit. Then tomorrow you're seeing more of the same with clear and sunny skies around the country. Top temperatures of 34 Celsius or 94 degrees Fahrenheit. And on Saturday, the hot weather persisting with temperatures ranging from the mid to high 30s in Celsius. And that's all for today's news. For more updates from Israel and around the world, check out our website, ILTV.TV. You can also subscribe to our newsletter and join us on our streaming platform at ILTV+. Plus. You can catch that across all of your devices. I'm Aaron Forrest. Be well. Thank you so much for watching and have a great weekend.